Ravi. How are you doing? Hey, good to see you. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to ask you, um, could you explain in a manner maybe more pragmatic than we're used to why a person should believe in the Word of God as the Bible and why they should basically believe every word it says as opposed to any other holy book and why they should give their entire life to Christ? <laughs> I mean, I know it's a really rough question, but... That's like saying, define God and give three examples. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that just the Trinity? Uh, yeah, well, you're, it's a legitimate question. I'm sorry for responding humorously there. Of course, it takes, it takes a whole lot of time. Uh, in my book, Can Man Live Without God, uh, which, was, which was a series of lectures delivered at Harvard, the second part of it deals with that very thing. So let me start off as best as I can. First, I believe that truth as a category does exist. Number two, it is possible in a majority of claims of philosophical and historical statements to verify the truthfulness of those affirmations. Third, I believe there are existential realities from which I cannot run which drive me to find the answers to the existential struggles that I live with, not just the philosophical ones. The philosophical ones are real and I have to deal with them, but so are the existential ones. And by the way, existentialism came as a response to the unpaid bills of philosophy. Philosophy had become so cerebral that the passions had been ignored and existentialism came into being and sort of tossed out the rationalistic way of interpreting things and went purely with the gut level feeling a la Sartre and Camus and so on. But I think what we are trying to do is if we are trying to find the bridge between the head and the heart, there are numerous ways of doing this. And the way you start off with by saying, if you take the Bible as the question, then why the Bible and why not any other system of thought? You start off with uh, the scriptures and ask yourself the question. Here there are 66 books by nearly 40 different authors over 1,500 years that are books on history, that are books on philosophical thinking, that are books on theological thinking and systematic thinking. Now, if the Bible made several assertions, one after another, that you found out to be false, either historically or philosophically or in the existential realm, you go further and further, and if you see that kind of systemic contradiction and failure, then you have reason to believe that I cannot really trust this document. It is not in keeping with the way I am seeing history and reality. But when you look at the scriptures, and by the way, the Bible is a very distinctive piece of literature to any other religious piece of scripture. Any Muslim will tell you that his book, the Quran, is word for word perfect. It is a perfect revelation of Allah in the eye of the Muslim. They will affirm that again and again. That's why no translation in, of the Quran will ever do justice in their estimation of the Quran. It is the perfect expression of, uh, of Allah himself as dictated to Muhammad who recited it. Now, the Bible as we, know, as we know it does not affirm that verbal perfection. I actually have a great deal of difficulty with verbal perfection. Are we really saying that no one word would have been better than the other word in, in, these, in the volume of material? But when you take the scriptures disclosed over centuries and over, over 1500 years, as I said, 40 different writers, 66 books, and you see the prophetic schema all the way down to the person of Christ. Let me give you an example of this. The book of Daniel is written in the late 500s before Christ. And yet, when you study the book of Daniel, you begin to see the specifics of a fantastic prophecy. He talks about a massive empire that will come into being, and how that, that empire will be, will be divided into four, and that empire will be led by what they call a strident, strong he-goat from the west, who will be marching several nations underfoot, but shall be suddenly cut off, and his empire will be divided into four. Those four then emerge into two, and those two blend into one. When you take the book of Daniel, written late 500s, and put it pro forma onto Alexander the Great in the 300s before Christ, you see the stridency of Alexander suddenly cut off in his 20s, four kingdoms emerged given to his four generals. Those four come into the two, the Ptolemaic and the Seleucid empires, that emerged then into the Roman Empire, centuries before to be so specific in prophecy. 
you go to the prophecy of Zechariah who describes the crucifixion of Christ they shall look upon him whom they have pierced and weep as a mother weeps for her only son you go to the prophecy of Isaiah and see the how the Christ is going to suffer immediately you see the supernatural immediately you see the supernatural so when you take the miraculous element you take the historic element you look into the scriptures and you see there is an authenticity and it all points to one perfect person the person of Christ Bruce Metzger who is a scholar from Princeton made the comment he said after you take the 20,000 lines of the New Testament it is safe for any scholar to say there's at least a 99.6% accuracy no ancient document none has the kind of documentary support that the Bible has over 5,000 documents or even Time magazine in 88 I think Richard Osling made the comment one thing we cannot deny the Christians he said is the documentation that is available across the centuries nothing in ancient literature matches it neither Homer nor uh, Aeschylus nor any one of the nor the Gaelic Wars of Caesar or whatever so when you've got this kind of documentation this kind of accuracy that kind of a person in the person of Christ I think you've got pretty compelling evidence to see why it is that we need to take Christ very seriously thank you